topic, so I'm just going to really quick show this index file. So if you're at the top of my index file, I've got a couple some require statements. I'm pulling in the Bootstrap distribution JavaScript. I've got um, a template, another you template. This is JavaScript. That's what I was saying. This is what this is a module now. So now we're writing in a modular way. We're using this require term. This require term is provided by the module bundler, so that it will otherwise it wouldn't do anything. Require is not a JavaScript reserved word by default, but it's provided by the module bundler and it uses that to resolve these things. So because I created a a uh, resolver path for something like NVD3 or Moment, I can just type require Moment and it'll pull in Moment, loads it in from Node Package Manager's uh, folder here. <coughs> Modules, moment. So that's actually loading up this guy first before any of this code runs. So it requires a synchronous operation um, in the code. Don't, like the way the bundler works is, is it'll optimize automatically, but as far as the code is concerned, it requires a synchronous operation. Uh, but anyway, so you see how this looks a little different than it would if you didn't have a module? Because I might just have written this, right, without this. And you wouldn't know where that word, you wouldn't know where this variable came from, or this one or that one. Um, like I said, this makes it look a lot more like Python or Java or something, where you can see where your variables are coming from. And across a large application, this gets really, really important. <laughs> because on a two-page application or on a one-page application that has five functions, it doesn't matter. On a really complicated data viz application, this gets really, really important. You have to do things like this. Because you're kind of not allowing, you're, you're sort of like shooting yourself in the foot otherwise. Um, so one last thing about Webpack. Webpack um, can load things through, it's like a little compatibility layer. So NVD3 is a graphing library built in D3. NVD3 doesn't have, doesn't provide a module output. So requ require, common JS modules are supposed to export their, their uh, output explicitly. So you say module.exports and you say what am I exporting, a function, an object. Uh, this guy isn't written that way, it's just a big old function. And it attaches itself to the window, which is a lot of the you know, traditional JavaScript stuff does. So Webpack provides a way to say, hey, I want to import this thing, and I'm going to, it's going to attach itself to the window, and it exports window.nv. So when I require this, it shelters it and gives my module this thing without actually polluting the global namespace. It's magical. So instead of this being on the window for real, it's only on the window, it's only provided at this variable name that I've specified. Um, it, it's provided to my module at that variable name, not to everything else. Can you explain NVD3 a little more? Yes. NVD3 is, uh, if I have internet, I'll show you. But it's just the It's not, there's, it actually has, it's not my favorite thing in the world as far as like the code base and the way you use it. It's super rigid. You have to produce exactly the right object and jam it in there. But it's one of the only, um, it's one of the sort of larger projects trying to use D3 to do. You see how this is resizing? So D3, uh, this is why people like D3, it's because of that. You see that graphical pretty painting? That's what, that's what D3 is, that's the magic sauce that D3 has. Is 2D or 3D? Uh, it's, it's, it's 2D, a vector. Yeah, ve SVG. SVG. Um, so the reason I was putting it in, the, in this example was I might want to use that, right? Because it looks cool, but if you, with your module system, if you just say, pull this in on Bower and require it breaks. So Webpack gives you a way to deal with this. Even though they didn't write it in a friendly way for a module system, it'll still work. All right. I'm just going to do grunt really quick here. Um, so grunt file I talked about already. So here's a grunt file. Um, you'll notice that I, and the, re, the common JS pattern you can use across your whole code base. So even though this is actually being interpreted like <coughs> as a dev tool, it still has the same format as my actual application code. I've still got my require statements. I'm just pulling in some Webpack configuration now. And I'm going to initialize grunt with these options. 
there's Webpack can do dev and production mode. Uh, the dev mode, I've written some middleware for a thing called Connect, which does memory-based uh, bundling. Um, I've, I'm using less for CSS to uh, make CSS less painful and terrible. So I need a watcher for that, and I need to have the less compiler have some options so it can make a source map for me. Does, does anybody know? Does anyone know what a source map is? Does anyone? Does anybody know what a source map is? So you can debug it. Yes. You get line numbers. So less can do the one of the newer features of Firefox 29. It just came out. Um, Firefox 29 supports CSS source maps for less. So less does this kind of bundly thing with modules, but it does it for CSS. Um, Firefox 29 and Chrome both support source maps for less, so less has this configuration that will create one. It makes it a lot easier to debug your less stuff. Um, JavaScript has had this support for a little longer, except for an Internet Explorer where they just don't want to, I don't know why, they just, IE 11 even, they're like, no, we don't want to do that. We're going to do our own weird, goofy, I forget what it's called right now. Yeah, it just doesn't, they just don't want to. It's not because they can't. Um, they have their they have a thing called conditional compilation that they made up that is allows you to do a similar thing as a different syntax and does it's Microsoft's the Microsoft way. <coughs> I love Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> so so from a browser support perspective, all of these tools. You know, one of the big questions is uh, yep. I go ahead and run it on a uh, IE or on. Or fire It'll work on or everything. All these uh, source mapping is important for debugging, but um, you can still see your file as a single unconcatenated output. So, I mean, unminified. Sorry. Um, is your debugging experience going to be worse than IE? Yes, it will. Is it impossible? No, because you can still set breakpoints. You can still do what you might want to do anyway. It's just that IE can't tell you which which artifact file this really is, or like which of your actual code modules this came from. In Internet Explorer, you're going to see index.js, and index.js is one thing, as opposed to seeing that the error came from models index.js up here. Uh, that won't be that way forever. All the, Everybody needs this stuff to work, and so what we're going to have to do is hack in this conditional compilation support thing that Microsoft wants into these tools. It's just that since every other browser works the other way, and because it isn't as hard to get things to work across browsers anymore, because the standards are I made, mean, IE 11 is actually a pretty good browser. It supports most standards. So it isn't as painful, and you don't have as many weird issues as you used to. It's not as big of a deal. Having just written something that specifically targets Safari and then had to run in IE 11, we had very few problems. Very, very few. Um, you're talking a lot about browsers, but a lot of development now is going to be towards you know, HTML5. Aware apps. Yes. Is this um, this is little? yes. This is the reason that I think this is important is because this is exactly how you want to do that. I think because especially with an app, you don't you don't there maybe isn't. A, I mean, it, maybe it's going to be in a, the new Sencha weird thing that deploys in the app store <laughs> and like pulls in. I don't know if anybody has Sencha stuff, but they just put out this cool app wrapper, and the app wrapper allows you to provision applications into the app wrapper for your enterprise or whatever, and then have them run through the app, and, but it provides the interpreter. So everyone has the same interpreter, so it makes it easier to write code. Okay. Um, this is a good way to do this because you're fundamentally like giving yourself this nice minified thing. That's the same thing you'd have to do to do a HTML5 app with PhoneGap or something that you want to deploy, or Cordova, you want to deploy to the app store, you're going to want to do this bundling anyway. So this pattern is this pattern is really useful for that. And common JS modules um, work on Node as well as using this method. And the reason that's nice is if I wanted to run some of my code on Node and serve some views that way, I can without having to rewrite everything. So I could compile some views and shove them up. So maybe I want to create an SVG on the server because it's going to take way too long on the client for some reason. So maybe somebody's phone is super wimpy and you know that isn't going to draw like a 400 series graph or something. Well, you can run, you could create that SVG on Node and serve it forward, but share the code and choose to run it on one place or the other depending on something, a mobile domain maybe or something. So, um, so anyway, this is just the Grunt is again is sort of build tooling. So the, the really nice thing that I think is the most useful part of this is that it gives you this really cool way to do servers with something called connect. 
um, Connect has a, has a pattern called middleware. And it allows you to intercept a request and process it with a middleware and return it. So that's really, really powerful. So I can take any HTTP, HTTP request, figure out what it asked for, and do something and return it all on my dev box. So you can do a stat and show a directory listing. You can do way more complex things. So what I'm doing now here is I'm actually running this Webpack thing with a middleware piece in memory so that in dev mode it's faster. So instead of writing it to the file system every single time, it just runs it in memory. It re-bundles everything in memory and creates a source map and does it all faster this way. And it, and it blocks the request so that you know that your you know, bundling process is finished. So you're not like, is the code refreshed? I don't know. And that, because that sucks. So the middleware is part of the node? Middleware is, is, a, is a pattern that, it, that comes from this connect project, which is a, and connect is a, just a, a sort of a packaging for a, an HTTP server written in node. So a node like the, the super, uh, Traditional node example is a three-line HTTP server or whatever. Connect just gives you a much nicer pattern for doing a lot of things other than that three-line example. Uh, and the middleware is one of the most useful ones of those things, I think. Because you see how I'm just, you can just define some stuff here and you just push them in and it intercepts them as you go forward. So the other one I've put in here is a mock, a mock thing. So I'm, I'm mocking up an API, I have like five minutes. Um, mocking up an API and pulling in up here, I'm just requiring my mock API. I'm adding a middleware interceptor for it. Um, I'm catching calls to this URL, generating some super simple fake data and pushing it forward. But being able to do this is super useful. Like I can slow it down. I can fake the lag. I can, and I'm using a real request, right? So like it's, from the client side, this is exactly the same as it would be if it came from whatever back-end system. Um, and it's, again, because I'm using this connect proxy, and it, I can just shove this additional code into that request path, and it just happens. So that's why connect is awesome, because it's very, I mean, this is hardly anything, right? Like, I mean, my make data, fake data thing is more complex than the server, <laughs> because there's nothing to do. It's, all it's all done for you, it's super easy. The, the patterns are very uh, easy to understand in general. Um, the only complex part of it, I think, is you have to know what a buffer is, and you have to sometimes, you know, resolve a buffer. But it's other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, back this quick. I'm forgetting. So that's about connect. Um, talked about that. Build against production. What else do I do? So, okay, before I move on to this, because this is only a five minutes left, so I'm gonna, not going to do anything with the output yet. Um, but just to show you what this looks like, um, I've got a serve task here. So, oops, sorry, err. Um, this is running grunt server. So, again, grunt's declarative thing. I'm registering that this server task is going to run clean, connect, and watch. So clean is going to delete my build directory. Watch is going to run a watcher process for less. Um, there's actually a better way to do this, but I'm not going to get into it right now. Um, and it also runs my connect server, which loads up my middleware for the uh, webpack, and it loads up my mock API. So because I ran that, um, it, you can see here that it's doing, uh, it's evaluating my resource, my index.js. It produced a less artifact and um, it says it's valid and it's ready to go. So what that means is that I can go to here and I can refresh it and I have something on the screen. Uh, for production, just for fun, so you can see this. Um, Webpack takes a little longer because it's gonna run some evaluation for you. It's gonna make your artifacts smaller. And so especially when using libraries that have a lot of junk in them, Moment is a date library. It has a ton of junk in it. So like, I don't really need this language. I'm not even sure what that language is, actually. Um, what? Oh, okay. ZH. 
So this is taking a second. What this is going to show you when it finishes is that it has removed all the things I'm not using. So it took, it evaluated, so here we go. So it evaluated by doing a parsing of those libraries, which things I was actually pulling in from them, and it dumped everything else. So it makes your code as small as possible. This only works though with libraries that have actually a module system built in to themselves. So like we do, CanJS has one. Most modern libraries do this. They build, they allow you to use the AMD version or the module version instead of the compiled version, and that's good because it allows you to just cleave off all the junk out of the library you're not actually using. And because we're delivering the code over the wire, that's really important. We don't want to shove an extra 200k of code down we don't use because why? It's not as big of a deal as it used to be because it went as broadband, but still. <laughs> All right, that's about all I can do. Anything else I can answer about any of these things? There is another another panel in an hour, um, and I will talk more about what this part of this actually is and how some of this stuff works. So, so, so the the topic of the of the talk was HTML5. Yeah. And you talked mostly about JavaScript tools, which is great. Yes. I mean, I, I actually like that maybe more, but. Uh, so how does this all tie in with HTML? I know you mentioned five. I know you mentioned a little bit earlier that you can do it, but what? HTML5 is a really bad term. HTML5 means a means. Yeah, it, it, there, there is an HTML5, there are HTML5 web APIs. So like Socket is one of them, local storage, session storage. But you use JavaScript to access these things. So when you look at what, what is HTML, HTML5 is also a markup language version for HTML, which just is some you know newer versions of some tags. There's a search input and there's number inputs and phone. Um, but but fundamentally, when people talk about HTML5, what they really mean is a like generally mean is some kind of a single page application, web application at this point. So when someone says I want to build an HTML5 app, they mean I'm going to build a single page JavaScript driven application that doesn't necessarily you know, refresh 15 pages as you move between views. Uh, and you can package it and deliver it through an app store with something like Cordova or whatever. Uh, that's kind of where it ends up, what it ends up meaning. So when you say an app store, are you talking about phone apps or are you talking about phone apps? Phone apps, or any app really. Um, Microsoft stuff you can do through Windows Store. And it had actually Microsoft supports a full HTML5 develop, 